notification over that channel. I am Sheena Hope. Like, share, subscribe, and leave comments below. This is a place where I give practical financial tips that anyone can understand and you can begin to implement now. Today's topic, things I forgot to say. I realized over the course of the videos, I wanted them to be short, like 10 to 15 minutes, but there were a few things that I forgot to say. And I want to use this episode really to highlight some of those things. So the first thing I want to talk about is on the credit episode, I didn't mention medical bills. Medical bills is another way that a lot of people experience low credit scores because they don't pay their medical bills. And usually it's something that may happen unexpectedly that caused them to have the med these medical bills. So one thing I want to say is, one, you can set up a payment plan with the companies for the medical bills to help, you know, keep a good credit score or credit rating. But another thing I want to say is maybe consider looking into a health spending account or flexible spending account plan at your job. A lot of times these are offered to employees with high deductible plans and that allows you to save money for medical expenses. So in most cases, like for example, at my job, our deductible was $1,750. They gave us $1,000 with the medical reimbursement accounts, but the $750, we had to pay out of pocket for that. So one of the ways that you could do it is by setting monies aside in your health spending account. And so then if medical expenses came up, they will pull the money from your health spending account before they send a bill to you. And that's the way that you can help manage the medical costs that may add up. In most cases, most HSA accounts allow you to roll over the monies each year, but that's something that you want to look into um, for your HSA accounts or your FSA, flexible spending accounts. I don't believe they allow you to do that with a flexible spending account, but you want to look into what are the differences between the two and what your job allows for you to have so that that's something that can help manage your costs associated with medical bills. And then last but not least, Worst case scenario, if your medical bills are too high and you don't feel like you can afford to pay for it and it's hit collections and now it's on your credit report and all this stuff, you can always consider filing for bankruptcy. Now, bankruptcy isn't something that I would, you know, encourage you to do, but it is something that you may need to look into if you feel overwhelmed with your medical bills or your credit scores is being impacted as such. And you can look into... Um, pretty much the types of bankruptcy, chapter 7 versus chapter 13, as well as understanding the impact that it may have on your credit report, how long does it last on your credit report, and then um, how do you rebuild your credit after you do have a bankruptcy on your credit report. I know in some places they highlight or emphasize or market bankruptcy a lot, like in Chicago, is marketed all the time versus in other states you rarely hear about bankruptcy so um consider where you are but usually you can look into it and do a little bit more research to find out if bankruptcy is the right place or right thing for you to do the next thing i want to talk about is on the debt episode i talked about ways that you can leverage your debt but i didn't go into particulars with the different types of student loans so for student loans you have your subsidized student loan which is a loan that you must demonstrate financial need and is usually capped at a certain amount each year. So the first year you may be able to get $3,500. The second year you may be able to get $4,500 on and so forth, but you have to show that you need the money before they give the money to you. The benefit of a subsidized loan is that you don't pay interest until you leave from school. So after you graduate, six months after you graduate, then you begin to pay interest on the money. The flip side, the unsubsidized loan, as soon as you take some monies out for unsubsidized loan, it begins to accrue interest immediately. You do not have to demonstrate financial need for this money. So in most cases, this is where a lot of people get into trouble because they can take out so much loan money. And a lot of times it's the unsubsidized loan that they're taking monies from. And then as soon as they take the money out, it begins to accrue interest. So you want to look at the types of loans that you take out for your student loans to make sure that they are appropriate for you and the career that you're going into. Another thing you may want to consider is a tuition payment plan when going to college. Most schools offer this. It allows you to pay for your tuition on a month-to-month -month basis. And in most cases, you may need to start it in the summertime or during Christmas break. But you can look into the school and see how you can set up a tuition payment program and pretty much pay a month-to-month -month rate for your tuition. And you may only pay for one class or two class, but it's a way to reduce the amount of student loan debt that you take out. You may also wanna just consider taking your time with going to school. If you feel like you can't afford to pay for all 15 credits at that time, maybe you should look at, into or consider going to school part-time to see if that works best 
or well for you regarding what your goals are. But of course, if you decide to do that, then just make sure you stay on track and stay focused to graduate. A lot of times when people start making money, they forget about school because it's like, oh, I'm making money today. That may be good for the moment, but you got to think in long term. School is for the long term. It's not just for the hot thing right now. Sometimes kids go to school and they start being a bouncer at a club or doing this, that, and they make money that way. And then they forget about the fact that they're not going to be in school forever. And do you really still want to be doing it at an older age? Or how long do you want to do it? Even if you decide to do it at an older age, how long do you want to do it? Is that going to be your main source of income? Or do you plan to do other things? Um, so think about those things when you go to school and really think about it in regards to the amount of student loan debt that you, that you take out. The next thing was setting financial goals. I know that we're in the Christmas season, so a lot of people are spending money this year for Christmas, and this has been a tough year for us. We've gone through a lot, but I want to encourage you to set a goal for how much money you plan to spend for Christmas and then stick to that goal, okay? Um, the greatest gift that you could give someone is your presence, and in most cases, people will like that over the actual gift anyways. So really try to... Set a goal for how much money you plan to spend and then stick to that goal for your Christmas season. Another thing that you could consider is look at your credit card points. Most credit cards have it where you can accrue points once you spend money on and so forth. One way to try to keep your spending low for Christmas is to use your points to buy gift cards for people. So um, I used to do this a lot, but based off your points that you have in your credit card, usually you can get $25 gift cards to different places, gas stores, um, gas stations, I mean, or different stores uh, in the neighborhood. And so I would say, look into your points on your credit card and maybe you could use some of your points to buy gift cards for people. That way you're still getting them something, but you're not really spending the money right then because you already spent the money. So now you can use some of these points that you have in your credit card to get gifts for Christmas and everyone will be happy. And it helps you to stay within your budget for the amount that you plan to spend. The next thing for the investing episode, um, some people were asking me like what to invest in. And of course I can't tell you exactly what to invest in. Um, but one of the games that I used to play with kids is, uh, I would say play this little game called Own What You Wear. And what that means is basically I'll just walk through their day daily activities. So when you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing you do? The students will say, oh, I brush my teeth. So I say, what toothpaste do you use? They were like, Col Colgate. So, okay, Colgate. We write that down. We look up the stock price. Um, next thing, we just go through their day. What stores do you shop at? Walmart, Target. What type of car do your parents drive? A Ford, a Toyota. What type of shoes do you wear? Um, Nikes. Or what type of phone do you have? An Apple phone. And we just go through and see what are some of the things that they're already utilizing and then just buy stocks in those companies. And the way that that's the easy way to start is because if something happens to one of those companies, nine times out of 10, you're going to be the first one to know because you are a consumer of their product. So you're already investing into that company, whether or not you own stock or not, you're already naturally interest, interested into that company. So that's an easy way to get started with um, investing in stock. Go to the companies that you're already familiar with. What are the, like literally, what are the stores that you shop at? What are the products that you use? Those could be companies that you can begin to own stock in as just the beginner's guide to looking into things. After you get comfortable with doing that, then you can begin to do more research and branch out into other stocks. And so then you wanna look at their um, earnings growth. You wanna look at their price to earnings ratio. You may wanna look at their, look into their debt to equity ratio or their competitive advantage with other people in their industry and just how do they do overall in their industry? What is their social responsibility or what are their social values? What does that look like? What does it mean to you? Is it something that you can get on board with? And then you can go through a whole lot of research to determine what type of companies that you want to invest in and if they have the same values that you believe in. So that's a way to get started. Um, another thing people... Um, want to know about who should they have, have as a financial advisor or what should a financial advisor help them with. And I would say when you begin to talk to or choose a financial advisor, just like with anything else, you may want to do a little searching around for this, talk to different people. But one thing is overall, you want someone that listens to you. You want someone, if you say something two or three times, you want them to hear what you're saying and 
find solutions that meet your needs based off what your concerns are. And the reason why I say listen is because a lot of times financial advisors can sometimes get caught up in pushing a product to where they don't really listen to what the client needs are. Um, a prime example, um, I was helping someone with insurance and they were getting an insurance policy and they wanted a permanent policy, but they wasn't using like permanent policy. They wasn't saying that, but they kept saying things like whole life, want to make sure it's there when I die. All these different terms that let you know that they're looking for a permanent policy. But because at the time the company was pushing the index universal life product, that's the product that they was pushing on the person was that they get an IUL policy. And the IUL policy is not what the person was saying that they wanted because IUL policy can change their rate over a certain amount or a certain number of years, or they're based off of an index in the market, and that's just not what that person wanted. And so after I kind of talked to the person a little bit, because I worked for the company that he was working for, and I knew why he was pushing that product, because we had all had the same training, right? <laughs> so I told him, like, this isn't the product that she wants. She wants this type of product. And she kept saying all the buzzwords, even though she wasn't saying, I want a guaranteed universal life product. She wasn't saying like the exact name, but she was given a lot of terms that could like you could get that that's what she that's the type of product that she wanted. So you want someone that could listen to you. And even if you don't say all the right terms, they get what you're trying to say and they can align it with products that best meet your needs. The next thing is you want someone that you can learn from. So in the financial industry, they come up with products all the time. But with every product that they come out with, there's usually, usually some good things with those products and there's usually some bad things with those products. But each product has pros and cons, just like anything else in life. And so I think you should look for someone who you can learn from, meaning you don't want someone who is always talking about, you shouldn't have this type of product. This is the worst product in the world. And this is the type of product that you should go with. Whenever someone says that to you, you should be weary. You should ask questions. Like, well, why did they create this product if it's the worst product in the world? Or well, what's, you know, what's the good side of this product? Because there's usually some pros and some cons to each type of product that you have. So I know they was going through a little season. I don't know if this is still the thing, but Roth accounts. Everybody was pushing that you have a Roth account and that you don't need to have a traditional account. Well, you know, there's a pros and cons to both. And so if anyone comes to you and say, you don't need to have this, make sure you just ask the questions, well, what are the pros to this? Why was this created? How can this help me? You know, make sure you understand the pros and cons to both sides of things. And then from there, you can make your decision on what you want to move forward, what's moving forward. But ultimately, whenever you pick a financial advisor, you want someone who listens to you. Even if you don't say all the right terminology, but they can kind of gauge what you're saying. And then you want someone who you can learn from. So someone who can give you pros and cons to the product. Not someone that's just going to say, oh, you don't need this type of product. Okay, you want someone that can say, these are the pros to this product. These are the cons of this product. Based off your goals, this is why I think you should move here. This is why I think you should do this. You want someone that could go over financial planning for you. If you have more than $50,000 in assets, then you need to probably have a financial plan created for you to kind of decide where you want to go moving forward and how can you achieve those goals and what's the time horizons that you need to be thinking about. Now, you don't want to wait till you are in retirement and now you're trying to have a financial plan. You should really have a financial plan like early on so that you could better plan for your retirement or plan for whatever else that you're looking to do. So those were the things that I forgot to say in my first episodes. So I hope that this has helped shed some light. If you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to me on Facebook or Instagram, and I'll try to shed some light on your situation. Thanks again for watching these short episodes on financial tips. I hope that they've been something that has caused you to grow and learn and research more about and something that you could possibly implement today. Make sure you like, share, subscribe, and leave comments below. Thanks.